We are going to be in Ecclesiastes 3 this morning. Ecclesiastes 3. If you don't have a Bible, there should be a Bible in front of you. It should be on the screen. And we, so, man, every week, it's just you guys are so good at this pop culture game. Right? I mean, you guys have learned that the movie Groundhog Day is a ripoff of Ecclesiastes. Okay, not really. Right? And then Ecclesiastes 2 is straight Rolling Stones. And then today, like, okay, those were a little facetious. Today, if you are a person of, how do I phrase this, an older generation, you will recognize almost word for word the lyrics to a song by the birds. Not Simon and Garfunkel. The birds. The birds. And what we're going to see is there's, there's seasons to life, right? Like I, I think of, it's, it's spring, it is full on spring. And spring is a time of optimism. Some of you garden and you have been ferociously working to, to plant seeds, to prep plants, and you've been going to the store and getting soil and tending soil, all this stuff. And it's a season of optimism because you're not planting that seed expecting nothing to happen. Right, you're putting that seed in the ground expecting full well that something's going to happen. That plant is going to produce salsa. Right? That's, that's, why I, that's why I plant things. I want salsa. I, I'm not a man of many tastes. I just like some, some good, simple things. Salsa is one of them, man. And so that's why the peppers are going in. That's why the, the tomatoes are going in. And so spring has its optimism. Winter has its pessimism. It's going to be cold. It's never going to be anything but cold. This is how it is, right? Summer can have its cynicism. It's hot. We need rain. Autumn can have its rejoicing, and then we're right back to winter. And we come out of winter, and what do we do? Oh, it's just going to be the best year. It's just full of optimism. And we turn, turn, turn on all of this. Here's the thing. As we look at this, and, and I want you to see this, I really, I really want you to understand this, that the brevity of each season brings its own kind of beauty. I have learned in the time we've lived in Kansas to appreciate a flower that I, I had seen, but I didn't really know what it was until we moved here, and it's a peony, even though we had a peony plant that we transported from New Mexico here. It's peonies, and, and they go and they need a strong winter, it, it helps their roots, and then it up comes up, and right now, this time of the year, there's buds. There's buds, and they're just waiting. But here's the thing. They're not like roses, and that bud is going to turn into a flower, and then within a month, they're all gone. And you're just looking at this kind of frail, green thing. But here's the thing. Part of the beauty that makes a peony is its brevity. The fact that it's so short-lived. Last year, Amber went, and she, she, she has a cut flower garden. And her, she wants to cut flowers and put them in a vase, and, and there's a good chance that many of you have, have received some of those things in this room. Uh, last year, she went and delivered some to Nancy Rogers. Well, I had this inkling that this might happen. So she went, oh, and, and just Nancy being Nancy. She's like, oh, my goodness, these are beautiful, and and all this stuff, and, and about a week and a half later, a painting shows up, and it's a painting of the bouquet that Amber had made. And it's so interesting, because things have brevity to them, what we want to do is we want to capture them, right? This is why everywhere you go, people have a cell phone out, and they're like, I just got to get a picture of this thing, where we used to just stare, look, and try to savor it, put it into our memory. But because of the brevity of that moment, a, a graduation, a child walking for the first time, a beautiful bouquet of flowers. What do we, we want to take a picture as if we can make it last forever. But the beauty of the situation is found in the brevity. Right? That the 101st time of a child walking isn't near as exciting as the first. And you can't smell a picture. You can't smell a phone. There's something incredible about it. And so each season has its beauty and, and the brevity of it. I mean, you think about just a baby. 
I found myself looking at a newborn this week. It's got its onesie on, and I've never had this moment before. I, I missed diapers, and I missed waking up in the middle of the night and going, picking up the kid, put them on the changing pad, unzipping that onesie and, changing the, and just staring at them and looking at them and being completely exhausted and out of my mind. And then in that same moment, there's an 18-month-old, I'm looking at him, I'm going, oh my goodness. The brevity of those situations are what makes them so beautiful. And we want them to endure. But this is how life is. Life has its moments of beauty, have its moments of hardness. And so, we, we want to choose things over the next, and it just doesn't work that way. And so here's what we see in Ecclesiastes 3. Starting in verse 1, for everything there is a season and a time and for every matter under heaven. You guys are already hearing the song. A time to be born and a time to die. A time to plant and a time to pluck up what is planted. A time to kill and a time to heal. A time to break down and a time to build up. A time to weep and a time to laugh. A time to mourn and a time to dance. A time to cast away stones and a time to gather stones together. A time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing. A time to seek and a time to lose. A time to keep and a time to cast away. A time to tear and a time to sow. A time to keep silence and a time to speak. A time to love and a time to hate. A time for war and a time for peace. And so he asks this question. He looks at the seasons and he asks, what gain has the worker from his toil? I've seen the business that God has given to the children of man to be busy with. He has made everything beautiful in its time. Also, he has put eternity into man's heart, yet so that he cannot find out what God has done from the beginning to the end. I perceive that there is nothing better for them than to be joyful and to do good as long as they live. Also, that everyone should eat and drink and take pleasure in all his toil. This is God's gift to man. I perceived that whatever God does endures forever. Nothing can be added to it, nor anything taken from it. God has done it so that people fear before him. That which is already has been. That which is to be already has been, and God seeks what has been driven away. So we see in the midst of these seasons, but they're in the midst of these seasons, there's something more. Right? And so I, I'm going to ask you as we go through this to think about the season of life you're in. Right? If you're young, you probably don't see this as a season of life you're in, but believe me, it's a season, and it will go. And if you're older and ailing, that too is a season that will go. Just as you've walked through other seasons of life. And if you're a season with young children, it's brief. If you're a season with grandchildren, that's brief too. And so here's, here's Solomon the Koholeth, the, the preacher, the Ecclesiastes, the one who is looking at life and he's observing. And so now he's, he's stepped and he's just looked at everything. He's, seeing the, he's seen the cycle that things come on and he's looking at the seasons that exist in the world. He's looking at the seasons that he's walking through in his own life and he's just kind of trying to figure out what, what is going on? Why does any of this matter? What's the meaning behind all of this? If things just come to be born and then to die, what's the point? What's the point? So he's, he's trying not to lean too heavily into his cynicism. In fact, this passage that we're looking at right here, it actually excludes the, some of the main points that we see in Ecclesiastes. He doesn't say vanity of vanities. It's nice to have a break from that, actually. He doesn't say, he doesn't use the phrase under the sun in this. But yet, that's exactly what we're looking at. We're looking at the things under the sun. Right? He doesn't use the phrase striving after the wind, as he so often has. 
So here's what we need to see. We need to see that every season is ordained by God. Every season, right? We see it in verse 1, right? For everything there is a season, a time, for every matter under heaven. There's seasons, but even in the midst of all the seasons, God has ordained them. Look at verse 11. He has made everything beautiful in its time, right? God is the one who is working in the midst of all these seasons. There's, there's a season for birth. There's a season for death. There's a season to plant. There's a season to harvest, hopefully. And there's good to see this and understand that everything has a season. I'm going to say that again. It is good to see that, one, there are seasons. Everything has a season. And whatever you're walking through in life, that's exactly what it is. It's a season. And you may say, well, this has been a 40-year season. It's still a season. It will come to an end. It may not come to the end the way you hope it will. It may not be the way you think it will. Right? Because next week, he looks at the mortality of life. Right? As that you come through seasons, and then what finds you at the end of it all? Death. It's good to see this. It's good to understand this. It's good to understand that the season of life you're in right now won't last forever. Maybe you feel forgotten in this season. Maybe it's just been a season of unusual hurt. Maybe there's been pain that you didn't seek out and has found you. It's a season. It's a season, and it has come through the hands of a good God. Other seasons of life that are very much this, marriage is a season. Marriage is not forever. Parenting is a season. It does not, listen, parents, I'm in the middle of it. I'm, 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 I'm younger on some side, older on some sides. It's not going to last forever. Your career is a season. The phase you were in of your career is a season. Your education, whether you like it or don't, it's a season. Your youth is a season. Your beauty, it's a season. Right? <laughs> it's all a season. And, he, and, and you, you know this. Some seasons are very enjoyable. You just want it to last forever. Some seasons are just, when will this end? Will this ever end? And when you are in these seasons, you expect to last forever. It would be foolish to think, one, this is going to last forever. It's also foolish to, to try to make whatever season you're in to last forever. Parents, as kids get older, right, there's, there's, there's two thoughts. I can't wait to get this kid out of my house. Mm. And on the flip side is, I hope you never leave my house, right? And generally speaking, you know, it's usually the dad that's like, come on, son, it's time to grow up and get out of here. And the mom to her son's like, oh, no, don't ever leave. And it flips if there's a daughter involved. The dad's like, you, you're, you're never going to leave, right? You're, you're never going to get married. Please don't ever get married. I don't ever. It's a season. It's a season. Don't try to make it last forever. It's a foolish, foolish attempt. It's also foolish to think that whatever season you're in right now, it's only going to get worse. Or if you're walking in something good, well, the pits are coming tomorrow. They might, but you don't know. You don't, you don't know the season that's coming next for you. So here's what we do. We try to run from season to season. We are so bad as Americans at slowing down in general. We're so bad at it. We, we, we are not even done with one thing. We're already on to the next thing or three down the road. 
we just cannot slow down for anything, ever. And so what do we do? Well, in our, in our American mindset, in our I need to have all my good things in this life mindset, we try and try it in complete vain to say this season is worth nothing. I need to be there. God, why are you slowing me down? God, you need to hurry up. God, your timing's a little off. I often, um, I, I often find that the seasons of physical pain, I, I, I notice especially with teenagers who are in high school and they're at the top of whatever athletic endeavor they're in. They're, it's, it's their junior year, it's their breakout year, and all of a sudden, a couple games into the season, they go down, they break their ankle, and their whole season's gone. And they think, man, they, so they're already thinking about next year. They're thinking about, in those seasons, those are the seasons God speaks their loudest. And so listen, understand that the season you're in, whether it's long, whether it's low, whether it's high and happy, God wants to speak to you in the midst of it. God has ordained it. He has made everything beautiful in its time. So if you're a high schooler who can't wait to get out of the house, slow down. If you're a parent who just can't wait to get out of diapers for your kids, <laughs> slow down. If you're so close to retirement, Slow down. God has ordained your season. God has you where he wants you. The question is, is are you listening to it? Because beauty can be found in each season. If God has ordained it, if it's come through the hands of God, whether it be very good or whether it be very bad and very hard and very difficult, it has not escaped God. And there's, his goodness is there. And he is working in beautiful ways if we will acknowledge it. Because here's what our seasons do. Our seasons create longing. Our seasons create longing. The fact that we go from one season to the next, we just go, man, there has to be something more. I just feel like I'm constantly in this same place. When am I gonna, when's the rat race going to slow down? When am I going to get ahead? When, when am I finally going to be able to take a breath? When am I going to finally be able to come up for air? When, is, when am I going to get to think about me for five minutes? Our seasons create a longing. Right? This is why in verse 11, he, he walks through all these seasons, these seasons of life. He says he's made everything beautiful in his time. Also, he has put eternity into, the, into man's heart. Seasons create a longing. It makes us think, man, there's got to be something more. There's got to be something of permanence. And so we, we think, well, what is it? Or we, we look back and we go, well, I remember that phase, and that was a really good time. Man, if we could just extend that out, that would be awesome. So the fact that we move from one season to the next, the fact that we attend funerals, but the fact that we also celebrate births, every bit of that is pointing us in a direction if we will listen. It's pointing us to eternity. I don't know how many times in recent years, it really, just coming out of the COVID era, I, I will meet with a family, and, and oftentimes it's a family that, um, that I don't know, the funeral home has called me and they say they don't have a pastor or they, they just give whatever reason. And I will say, is there, is there a passage that is especially meaningful to you or to the family? They would, they, they, I have had so many requests for people to go to Ecclesiastes 3. And I just want to sit down and grab them by the shoulders like, do you understand Ecclesiastes? Do you understand? And, and, I, will, and I will explain that as I'm at the graveside or as, or as it, we're at the, the service. 
But here in the middle of that, like, they, they, they talk about these seasons. They're like, because they're, what they're thinking of the funeral is, there's a time to be born and a time to die. There's a time to plant and a time to harvest. And so they think, oh, that's really good. But then, man, I, I go, look at verse 11. The fact that we're standing here, we're looking at this grave, and this person has come to the end of their seasons. Seasons are done. We've gone from born to die. We're, we're now at the time of plucking up. And it would be foolish of us to stand in any of these moments and to say, this is all there is. Isn't life great? No, every one of those seasons makes us long for eternity. Our heart yearns for it. This is why I think people are exploring space. Because they're not really exploring space. It's not like they're going out there with probes. They're looking for something more. And so every, every scientist, everything is this, is this expedition, it's this quest for, there's got to be something more, there's got to be something permanent, there's got to be something beyond, and, and here's what's so awesome, there is. They're just looking in the wrong places. And so whatever season you're in, are you ready to listen? Because your heart is longing for eternity. You just may not know it yet. Your heart is longing for heaven. Your heart is longing to be with God forever. It's just a matter of what you're going to insert into the place of God in between now and then. In the midst of the seasons that God ordains, in the midst of this longing, there is a forever beauty. A forever beauty. Verse 14, I perceive that whatever God does endures forever. There is something that's forever. We're just not going to find it in gardening. We're not going to find it in our careers. We're not going to find it in our parenting. We're not going to find it in our marriage. We're not going to find it in a bank account. We're not going to find it in retirement. We're not going to find it by looking at the things that are under the sun. We have to look, we have to perceive, we have to grasp what God is doing. That he has done a forever work. He has made us, he has made, listen, every person he has made for eternity, period. It's just a matter of, will they spend eternity with God in the new heaven and the new earth? Or will they spend eternity in hell? Those are the only destinations but understand, we are all made, we are all shaped, we are all designed to be heading towards eternity. And there will come, and here's what's so great, in the seasons that we're in in life, our body is young, our body is old. We get exercise, oh, I feel younger again, but then I feel older again. The mirror looks good today. Ooh, the mirror doesn't look as good today. There's coming a day where God will give us in the new heaven and the new earth, we will get a new body. There's, God does forever work. Right? God stamps things with permanence for a reason. And so knowing that there's a forever beauty, I, I, I want you to think, I want you to pause, that some of you in here this morning are in a season. You're hurting. You're hurting. You're hurting about a, a, a past regret. You're hurting because of grief. Maybe it's the loss of a loved one, or maybe it's the loss of a dream. And you're in this season. And you want to be beyond it. You want to be through this. You want, to be you want to stop with asking the question, will, will, will today be the day that this changes? Will today be the day that there's something new and something different? So the seasons seem to last forever, but make no mistake, there's one thing that lasts forever. It's the work of God. Right? I perceived whatever God does endures forever. So stop. 
wherever you're at in your season, stop. Uh, you, you need to grasp what God does. You need to grasp what God has done. And you need to grasp what God is doing. Because we get so fixated on our season that we push God to the side and we forget how faithful God has been. And when we forget how faithful God has been, we forget and ignore that God will be faithful. And we certainly miss that God is faithful right now. He has made everything beautiful in its time. And he, I perceive that whatever he does endures forever. Forever is a very long time. But you need to understand how God is eternal. God never had a birthday. He has always been and always will be. He sees time very differently than we see time. And so, because we have this forever beauty, listen, we can accept life's seasons when we grasp the beauty of Him. Because here's the, we live in this tension. It's, a, it's, it's such a tension that we hold to what is temporary and what is eternal simultaneously. Right? We, we live in the already and not yet of the church. We live in the already and not yet of, we're, man, I'm in Christ, but someday I will fully be in Christ. I will be with Christ Forever, But here we are in the, in, in the now, where we're holding on to this world, but we're trying to hold on to heaven all at the same time. And we feel this tug, and we feel this pull. And when we get in seasons where life is hard, we need to look up, because what we're going to do if we're not careful, we're going to tug more and pull more on what is temporary. And we're going to totally miss what's eternal, what's forever. So are you mourning? Are you dancing? Have you had a long winter? You know, I'm not talking like Kansas long winter. You know, I'm talking about a winter of, of your family. I'm talking about a winter of your soul. Where it's just cold, windy, it's bleak. You don't see anything growing. I, I, I want to encourage you this morning to grasp what is eternal. In the midst of what is temporary, I want you to grasp it. I want you to grasp Jesus. Right? I, I want you to grasp the timeless one. I want you to grasp the one who is eternal, who has always been and always will be. I want you to grasp the one who is immo uh, he's, he's immovable. I want you to grasp the one who is unchangeable. I want you to grasp Jesus. Look, look back at verse 2. Verse 2. There's a time to be born and a time to die. Was that not Jesus? Who, who from the outset of eternity, Jesus, there was this plan in place by the Father the Son and the Spirit, and they said, we know what we're going to do. We know what we have to do. We know what we will do. Is there was going to come a day where God was going to be born as a man. And what was he born to do? He was born to die. Jesus knows the seasons. He lived through the seasons. I want you to grasp Jesus, who there was a time to plant and a time to harvest. How many times did Jesus come through and he's talking about sowing, sowing seed, and there's going to come a day where there's going to be a harvest, and the judgment's going to come, and he's going to separate the wheat from the tares. He's going to separate the sheep from the goats. This is Jesus. We grasp him now. There's a time to kill and a time to heal. Oh my goodness, how many times did people try to kill Jesus? 
Talk about Houdini. Jesus, man, it'd be a crowd. They're all going to stone him. All of a sudden, boop, he's out the other side. And what had he been doing that whole time? He's just been going around healing people. Jesus, Jesus is in this passage. Jesus is in this text. It's Jesus who in verse 4, we often remember at Marvel the fact that God, the God of the universe, came down and cried. Why? Because there was a time to cry. And he laughed. There was a time to laugh. Listen, in the midst of your season, Jesus isn't just going to step in if you're mourning and say, come on, it's time to dance. No, he, he steps into your season. He goes, you're mourning. I'm mourning too. Right? This, is, this is exactly Jesus in John 11. He goes to see Lazarus and he goes to see the family. And what does he do? He doesn't say, snap out of it. You're looking at the wrong season. No. He sees beauty. He understands the purpose of the Father. And he executes on the plan. But he mourns. Listen, if you're in a season of mourning, of grief, of loss, you need to understand Jesus is saying, I'm here with you. It hurts me that this hurts you. Sin hurts Jesus. So grasp Jesus. And in all your seasons, you need to be anchored to the cross. In all your seasons, you need to be anchored to the cross. You see, there's a fixed point in your journey. Right? Anytime you feel lost, you have to find your, your north star. Right? Navigators, they would, they, what would they do? They would navigate by the stars. They would navigate by what is fixed. And sailors, they would get in trouble when they would start navigating by land. Or they, would, they would just try to, and, and when you're out at sea, there are no surroundings. So what do you do? And they would look And they would anchor their navigation to something bigger, something so far beyond themselves. So as you move from one season to the next, and then you move from that season to the next season, you move from that season to the next season, you need to be anchored to something. You need to find yourself tethered somewhere. You need a north star. Here's what's so great about our God. He is both a fixed point, and the cross is such a beautiful picture of that. He is the fixed point for your seasons and for your journey, but he also is a traveler with you. What a sweet encouragement. You're on a boat with Jesus. You look up and you get your navigation from the North Star. And Jesus says, see that constellation? I made that constellation. But he doesn't just stop there and say, you need a fixed point. He goes, but I've also been there. Let me show you the way. Right? This is the one who said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. I am with you always until the very end of the age. He is the fixed point, but he also travels with you in the seasons. Our timeless, incredible God. He holds times and seasons very differently than we do. Listen to verse 15. That which is has already been. All right? So he's saying what, the time we're in right now, it's like the past. That which is to be, the, the future, it's the present. And then this little phrase, and God seeks what has been driven away. This, in, here, here, glimpse this real fast. That which is, has already been. That which is to be, has already been. We don't think that way. We, we cannot function that way. We function on this linear time. 
Past, present, future. Here's, that's not how God sees things. God sees all of it and knows all of it in an instant, in a moment. He has known everything to be for all of eternity. When we talk about, when we use the big word, right, we use God's omniscience, his all-knowingness, this is what we mean. So in, in, in the lens of God, as we understand God, if we could peer as far as we could into the future, God already sees that. And what has been done, it's here with us too. Is this not the cross? Is this not the cross? Is that we who are 2,000 years removed from the cross of Christ is still with us today? Right? That which is, it already has been. And that which is to be has already been. Right? That we will go however far into our future and the cross will still be the anchor. It will still be our great necessity. But it doesn't just stop there. There's this funny little phrase at the very end of this. God seeks what has been driven away or what is cast away. It's this picture of God being our pursuer. That you go through season and season and season. In the midst of every season, in the midst of your mourning, in the midst of your dancing, in the midst of your hopelessness, and I hope in the midst of hope, what's going on is Jesus is pursuing you. We are those who have been driven away. We are those who have been cast away. In what sense? Our sin. Our sin, just as Adam and Eve were cast away from the presence of God in the garden, our sin does what? It separates us from the perfect God, the all-knowing, all-loving, all-powerful God. But it doesn't stop there. He doesn't just say, okay, you're in sin, let's just stay in that season. No, he comes and he comes after us. He seeks what has been driven away. He has faithfully done that. He continues to faithfully do that. Friend, he's seeking you right now, if if you'll listen. If you'll listen. Maybe you feel completely cast away. Maybe you feel completely lonely. Maybe you feel completely helpless. Maybe you are in an endless winter. Maybe the season of life you've been in is, if I could just get a little further along, or if I could just clean myself up to get to God, then I'd be okay. That's not how it works. Jesus is the one who seeks what's been driven away. Jesus is the one who, when you were still a sinner, died for you to show his love. And so the cross sets our marker. It's our marker. It's our marker of this world, but then there's a coming world. It's a gift now. It's also a gift that's still to come. This is why it would be so foolish to stand up and say, listen, you can have your best life now. This is as good as it's going to get, so you better eat, drink, and be merry. That's Ecclesiastes 2. You, you, better, you better die with the most stuff because then you're going to win. You better live it up while you can. Man, that would, that would be the most foolish thing any of us could say. It's a completely godless way to live. And it's a completely hopeless way to live. You see, we have been given a gift that we haven't fully even opened yet. Jesus came, he died, he wanted to enter into a relationship with you. Listen, if you have turned to Christ and believed in the work of Christ, then you have that gift. But then the gift will be more full when we're in the presence of Jesus forever. Not playing harps and sitting on clouds, like chubby angels with with tiny little wings. That's the stuff of fiction. That's not the stuff of the Bible. 
is that the forever that we're heading to in Christ is far more glorious. There's nothing our eye has seen, our mind can comp- comprehend that he has in store for us. Listen, as, as sometimes missed up in this world is, there's beautiful things in this world. And you're telling me my eye hasn't even seen or my mind can't even comprehend what God has in store for those who love him? Come on. So here we are, tethered somewhere in between this world and the next. And we need to be anchored to the cross, tethered to the cross. We need to be secure in our relationship with Christ. Listen, if, if you're going through seasons and you just, you, it just weighs on you, it hurts you, it is absolutely necessary for every person to be secure in their relationship with Christ. Like one, do you, have you entered into a relationship with Jesus? Has there been a point where you understood your sin? Your sin has separated you from God. Jesus came and died for that sin, to be the only way to have a relationship with him. And you believed in him, and you, you turned from yourself, and you turned to him. Has there been a time? Because that is a securing work here and now, but also for eternity. Is that a part of your story? That you're secure, in, listen, in an eternal love. That God's not going to come through a season in your life and go, I just don't know if I love that Tim guy today. I just don't know about that Tim character. Yesterday was a good day. Today, it's pretty rough. Tomorrow, I've seen it. It's not going to get any better. We have an eternal love. The security of our relationship with Christ is secured in Christ, not in us. cross sets the marker for this. Are you secure in your relationship? Are you set on the word? Listen, this is the timeless truth. Here's here's what I find. When when people enter into a hard season, they need some answers. They're wondering about their job. They're wondering about life. They're wondering about their family. They're just not sure... What I, what I find is when they enter into that season, they'll go along for a while, and they'll kind of grab their Bible, and they'll go, what does this thing say? That's the wrong time to start opening your Bible. I mean, it's still a good time. Don't get me wrong. The timeless truth is good for every season. And so what's going to happen is it's going to anchor you that when you find yourself from one season to the next, there's a truth that ascends above everything you're going to encounter. That's the one thing that I just love about Ecclesiastes is it speaks into our lives in such a strange and unique way. In small group this morning, we were talking about Tom Brady. Why? Because we saw Tom Brady in Ecclesiastes. Right? Are you anchored and set on the word? Not just a little bit, not just when it's convenient, not just when it seems best. But right? It's setting the compass for your life. In the midst of your seasons, secure in Jesus, set on the word. I would encourage you, this is, this is probably not for everybody, to keep a journal. Here's what journals do. Journals help us chart when one season comes to the next and when one season ends and we're in another season. I tell people who are grieving, who have entered into loss of a spouse, entered into the loss of a child or a parent, I often tell them, I wish I would have kept a journal when I entered into that season. Because what a journal does is it helps you chart progress. A journal is to a human soul what a spreadsheet is to an accountant, right? Spreadsheet, debits, credit. Hey, we're we're finally making a profit. Ooh, your retirement took a hit, right? A, A journal does that same thing. It charts the highs and the lows, and then 
what you will see is progress. And it will help you see long term. It will help you see your past, and it will help you see the future. So I would encourage you, be secure in your relationship with Christ. Be set on the word. Keep a journal. Last. Join a church. Like, not, not, just, not just a church, because church has kind of lost its meaning in our modern time. A, a gospel-preaching church. Here's, here's one of the things that church does, and I'm, I'm just going to step back, and I'm just going to take this in for a second. The church serves as an anchor in a very unique way. Because you step into a room with people, you step into a body, and you join together, you lock arms with people who are in, we're all in different seasons. And so when your season's in the mud, hopefully, you're locked arms with somebody whose season is not in the mud. And they have the compassion of Christ, and so they don't come to you and go, snap out of it, man. They come in, and they lock arms with you, and they say, I've been there too. I'm sorry you're having to go through this. Or they may say, you know, I've never dealt with something like that, but you know what? You should go visit with so-and-so. I know they had a time like that. You should, you should hear from them. Because all of a sudden what happens is you're grounded by being grounded in the word, by being grounded in the cross, and by grounded with other believers. It helps you walk. It helps you move. It gives you energy. And you have a perspective of there's more to this season. There's more to what's going on right now. It gives you perspective as a parent. It gives you perspective as a follower of Christ. It gives you perspective as a spouse. The church, the church has its thumb on something timeless. Don't listen to the naysayers who say the church is going out of fashion. They just don't know. They've never tasted the goodness. So be secure, be set in these ways. And, and I step back because I go, that's exactly the way. This is what I love. I love that in a room like this, we have people who are young, we have people who are old. It's what the church is supposed to be. It's what the church is supposed to look like. We talk about our God being timeless. We need to understand the word is timeless. Our relationship with Christ is timeless. So is the church. The church is going to last forever. Now, not the brick and mortar, not the carpet, not this. No. It's that the fullness of the church will one day be assembled. The trumpet will sound, and we will not be distracted in the foyer when worship is called. <laughs> we will come running, and we will bow. The church is what so perfectly tethers us between the world we're currently in and the world we're heading to. And every Sunday should be this beautiful picture of exactly that. Let's lock arms in our seasons. Let's grasp Jesus and be anchored in such a greater and deeper way that we can endure whatever comes tomorrow. It's been a weird couple years. I don't know what's going to come tomorrow. Neither do you. Even when the world wasn't weird, I still shouldn't try to predict it. You have one who knows, who cares, and who leads you. Who's seeking good for you and glory for him. It's my encouragement this morning. Listen, if you're not secure in Christ, that's the promise that's put before you. That to all who would believe in faith, you can be secure in a relationship with the Lord. Praying if you haven't settled that, you would come down this morning and you'd get that settled down front, visiting with, with somebody here.
if you need prayer for the seasons, if you need to come down and say, I just need to lock arms with somebody because this burden, it's, it's this hurt, it's just too much. Then come down and lock arms and get some prayer. Get some encouragement. Seek some, seek a compass that you would have in other believers. I'm going to ask the musicians to come up. They're going to lead us in a song of response. Are you listening?